Okay, thank you all for coming today and welcome to the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research. My name is Gwen Driscoll. I'm the Director of Communications here at the Center. And it's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers for today's health policy seminar series. But first, the obligatory plug. You can learn more about our seminar series in our newsroom or on our website, www.healthpolicy.ucla.edu. Or you can subscribe to our e-newsletter, Health Policy News, to learn about upcoming speakers as well as other center events, research, and data. And again, you can find it all on our website. Now to our speakers. Dr. Katherine Keatsman is a center research scientist and a public policy expert on aging generally and long-term care specifically. At the center, she is the project director of the Home Study which examines how low-income older Californians with long-term care needs develop and sustain a network of care that enables them to remain safely in their own homes. She also directs the Community Health Innovations in Prevention for Seniors, or CHIPS project, a CDC-funded systematic review of community-based programs designed to increase the uptake of clinical preventive services among adults ages 50 and over. Jacqueline Torres is a graduate student researcher at the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research and has worked on the home study since 2010. She is concluding her PhD in the Department of Community Health Sciences at UCLA's Fielding School of Public Health, where she focuses on Latin American health and Latino immigrant health and aging. Jackie will start a two-year postdoctoral position with the Robert Wood Johnson Health and Society Scholars Program at University of California, San Francisco, and UC Berkeley in the fall of 2014. Without further ado, please welcome both Catherine and Jackie. Thank you, Gwen. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for sharing your lunch hour with us, whether you're here in the room at the Center for Health Policy Research or joining us virtually. And I especially appreciate uh, the students who are in attendance because here at UCLA, it's actually finals week, as I understand. Um, so Jackie and I are really delighted to be here to represent the home study team. And this is the home study team. Um, and we're, uh, in addition to Jackie, myself, Stephen Wallace, who's the principal investigator of the home study, Graduate student researchers Charlene Chang, Yuen Tina Chan, and Center Associates An Sun Choi, Carolyn Mendez Luck, and Ted Benjamin. So we're very grateful to have the support of the SCAN Foundation to do this work. And in the five plus years that the foundation has been here in California, they've really uh, taken great strides in advancing quality care for older adults here and across the country. So in late 2010, we launched a longitudinal qualitative study, which we refer to as the Helping Older Adults Maintain Independence, or HOME study. You can see we took some liberties with that acronym, but we really believe that it captures the essence and the heart of our study. So today we're going to present some findings from the HOME study, which using an in-depth and qualitative approach has allowed us to document how older, low-income, Californians who are insured by both Medicare and Medi-Cal, often referred to as medi medis or dual eligibles, and who are managing multiple chronic and complex conditions and disability in their own homes, manage and maintain a network of informal and formal supports to maintain their independence. The longitudinal design of the study has enabled us to examine in real time how these individuals have gone through individual level changes in their health and functional status, and to observe how these changes have occurred in the context of ongoing policy and program changes that have affected both the availability of long-term services and supports and medical care and also the way in which these services are delivered. So the overarching goal of the home study is to put the face and the lived experience on the consumer of care that these policy and program changes affects so that policymakers and others may better understand how their decisions are affecting real people on the ground. So through select case studies and quotes, uh, Jackie will be presenting a little bit later, we'll, we will be sharing the words and experiences of a typical group of dual eligible older adults and their, and their caregivers in five California counties, many of whom we've been talking to since 2010. <clears throat> 
So right at this moment, we're actually on the verge of a major policy change occurring in California, and it's going to result in significant changes to the way that dual eligible older adults in California receive their medical services and long-term services and supports, um, or LTSS as it's represented on this slide. California's Coordinated in Care Initiative was signed into law in 2012, and it aims to improve both the quality and efficiency of care for dual eligibles by promising enhanced care coordination through the integrated delivery of medical, behavioral, and long-term services and supports, in part through a demonstration program which is being called Cal MediConnect. Um, this demonstration program is another product of the Affordable Care Act, which created a Medicare-Medicaid coordination office within the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS. And the intention was to find ways to make these two administratively distinct programs work together more effectively. One of the initiatives coming from this office and from the Center of Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, or CMMI, resulted in more than two dozen state proposals to develop demonstration programs that advance and test new models of care coordination for their dual eligible populations. In the California example, approximately 400,000 dual eligibles will be able to transition to a single organized or managed care delivery system within which they will receive all of their medical, behavioral health, and LTSS benefits. There are eight demonstration counties in California and all have varying timelines at this point for enrollment into Cal MediConnect, and they all have different managed care organizations available to consumers. And after many, many delays, some related to the process of the state finalizing a memorandum of understanding with uh, CMS, and others have been related to strong pushback by stakeholders um, who have some concerns about this transition. Um, after all of these delays, the first of three mailed notifications started to be sent out to beneficiaries this past January. And the very first, as they're called, passive enrollments are slated to be started to start on April 1st in one of the eight counties. So this is in just a couple of weeks. It's really important to note that those who are eligible for this new program will be passively enrolled, meaning that they actually will have to actively opt out if they want to continue to receive their Medicare benefits and retain their current Medicaid providers as they have them today. In our presentation today, we hope that we can illustrate the promise that CalMediConnect holds for dual eligible older adults, given that many have been managing with fragmented and <coughs> fragile networks of healthcare and long-term services and supports for quite some time. At the same time that CalMediConnect holds promise, however, it's also raised some concerns. Many consumers, family members, and providers are anxious about the coming changes. And many consumers have worked hard to cobble together the network of supports they currently have. And, and limited though they may be, they've developed relationships with providers who they trust and who they feel respond to their multiple chronic and complex health conditions. And they enable them to live independently at home, which is where all of these consumers prefer to be. So we will also touch on some of the concerns that have been raised around the impending transition to managed care. And at the end of the presentation, we'll discuss some policy recommendations that are intended to address some of these concerns. And then we'll open up the floor to uh, discussion about the best way forward. And we will have a lot of time at the end of the presentation for questions and answers. So I um, encourage you to think about what you would like to raise at that point. So in the title of our presentation, we talk about healthcare delivery changes. And just to be really clear, the way that we define healthcare, it's quite broad. In addition to sort of the traditional medical services, healthcare for these individuals includes long-term services and supports. And this is a diagram which shows uh, the, the home and community-based programs of long-term services and supports in California. These are supportive services that typically address a range of care needs and are provided in a variety of locations in the communities, in people's homes or in senior centers, and also in institutional settings, <laughs> in skilled nursing or assisted living facilities. So this graphic shows us um, IHSS, which is the In-Home Supportive Services Program. And this is a Medi-Cal program which provides and pays for personal care assistance. Uh, this is assistance with activities of daily living, which are things like bathing or dressing, and instrumental activities of daily living, such as help with cooking or cleaning. 
This program is intended for individuals who are at risk for nursing home placement, and it serves people of all ages, but the majority are 60 years of age and older. We also have community-based adult services, and this was formerly known as Adult Day Healthcare Services. This program provides therapeutic medical and social services for adults who are 18 years and older, and they have one or more chronic or post-acute condition, and two or more limitations with activities of daily living. It also provides respite for family caregivers. The multi-purpose senior services program provides enhanced case management for individuals who are 65 years and over and who are low income and actually eligible for nursing home placement. So it's this enhanced management that really helps them continue to live in the community. Other formal supports that are represented here include the visiting nurse, durable medical equipment, um, income programs like Social Security, Supplemental Security Income, Transportation Services, um, subsidized housing. The bulk of long-term services and supports, however, are actually provided by family and friends, and that's the largest bubble that's represented here. And this is really unpaid care that's provided by family members and friends, and also by pets. Yes, pets, we've learned, are a huge uh, source of support for older adults living in their homes. Um, older adults and their family members are often left with the very complicated task of identifying, coordinating, and managing this entire complicated array of services. So to step back to when we started the home study in 2010, the study began in the midst of the Great Recession and ongoing state budget crises in California. Our original intention was to track the experiences of dual eligible older adults as they faced cuts to their long-term services and supports. And at the time, a series of across-the-board cuts were being proposed. Up to 20% of care hours were being threatened. And fortunately, uh, for the most extreme recommendations, those were averted, largely through stakeholder pushback and lawsuits. Um, yet IHSS consumers at that time still experienced an 8% reduction in service hours over two budget years. And there were other cuts and changes. Most Californians will remember, as the repercussions of these cuts are still felt today. The Adult Day Health Care Program was dismantled. It was recreated <laughs> as what's called CBAS, and it, now it has tighter eligibility requirements, and so it has a reduced service population. Similarly, the number of individuals served through the MSSP program were re reduced. And many of our respondents um, also were affected by reductions in SSI cash benefits in 2011, and even before the home study began, dental benefits were cut back in 2009. So in order to document the experiences of our study participants, we used a qualitative approach. The IHSS programs in five counties helped us to recruit participants who are insured by both Medicare and Medi-Cal, who are over 65 years of age, who are receiving IHSS, and depend on a range of LTSS to stay at home, and also who were able to communi communicate effectively in either English or Spanish. For each study year, we conducted four in-depth interviews with consumers and, when available, their caregivers, both related and non-family caregivers who are currently involved with providing care. The first round of in-depth and open-ended interviews were done in person, with the consumers and caregivers, and the follow-ups were conducted by telephone. The interview, interview guides that we use follow a uh, uniform set of topics, but in the qualitative method, we encourage um, participants to reply in their own words. So often they lead us to other, other um, important issues that we don't necessarily know going in. Currently, we're just finishing up uh, the final set, uh, the final round of interviews in the second wave of, the, of data collection. So over the four-year period, we have interviewed a total of 54 cases. Uh, for some cases, we have only the consumer represented. For others, we have only the caregiver represented. About half of our cases are represented by both the care recipient and the caregiver. Our participants, our consumer participants, range in age from 65 years to 94 years of age. The majority are female, and they represent a range of racial and ethnic backgrounds. Four of our participants are monolingual Spanish-speaking. We have 30 caregiver participants who range in age from 25 to 72, with an average age of 57. The majority are also female, and these caregivers are also racially and ethnically diverse, most notably Latina women caregivers 
represent 40% of our sample. The majority of the caregivers we interviewed are not related IHSS providers, um, although there is an interesting range in how they describe their relationships with the consumer. Some are clearly more employer-employee type relationships, while others are described more like family. Thirteen of the family caregiver participants were paid through in-home supportive services, which is a consumer-directed program, and it allows consumers to hire the, hire the caregiver of their choice, including family members. So with few exceptions, all of our interviews were audio taped, audio taped and transcribed verbatim. And these data were then independently coded by at least two members of the research team using a line-by-line -line in vivo process, which simply means that the codes are kept really close to the words of the respondents. So we're ac ac accurately capturing their experience. We then come together as a team. In the process of coding, we develop a code list, group codes into categories, and identify emerging patterns and themes. And also note interesting exceptions, or sort of in the quantitative world, you would call them outliers across the cases. So in the first year of the study, our primary objectives were to learn how consumers piece, piece together a network of formal and informal care to remain independently at home. We also were interested in identifying any unmet needs and to describe how consumers and their caregivers were affected by changing needs and resources. We learned that most of these older adults are managing a complex and fragile web of formal and informal supports. All share a common determination to stay at home and maintain their independence. Many of these older adults are struggling with increasing disability over time, have physical and mental health needs that are unpredictable and sometimes are unmet. Many lack sufficient hours of personal care assistance at home. And when they can, and when they're available, family caregivers try to fill in the gaps. Many of these older adults in our group, however, do not have family support. And so they just have to make do with what they have. So now I'm going to turn this over to Jackie, who's going to present some case studies and quotes that bring these findings to life. OK. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so as Catherine said, we want to start to illustrate some of our findings by turning to the actual experiences and words of our home study participants. So earlier in our talk, we showed a general map of long-term services and supports for home-based older adults. And here we've mapped out the support network of Margaret. So Margaret's an 81-year-old woman who's participated in our home study since it's the beginning in 2010. And uh, she's worked as an accountant for most of her life. She's a mother and grandmother. And her primary health conditions include heart disease, diabetes, and depression, and she's legally blind. So Margaret has a pretty dense network of long-term services and supports compared to most of our respondents. She makes use of many home and community-based services, including uh, an in-home supportive service uh, caregiver, a very supportive case manager through her county MSSP program, and Meals on Wheels. Uh, she participates in social and informational activities through a local blind center, as well as through her senior subsidized housing complex. And she uses transportation services that seem to reliably pick her up at her housing complex and take her to her nearby doctor's appointments, which are all geographically located within close proximity. And for a fee, she's able to t use these transportation services to go to social activities, attends church most Sundays, and events with her family nearby. So Margaret's family members are around, and this includes her daughter, who's her paid IHSS caregiver. And they help fill in the gaps in many cases where her formal care network falls short by providing assistance in the home with activities that aren't covered or allowed under IHSS, but also being available for around-the-clock care after medical procedures or in the case of medical emergency. So she's pretty much on the far end of the continuum in terms of managing a complex web of long-term services and supports in addition to her medical care that, for the most part, really do appear to meet her needs. However, um, here Margaret reminds us that this relatively dense uh, network of supports and services that does appear to be working for her is actually quite fragile. So she reminds us that every piece counts, saying, I, don't, I do what I can, but there's a lot of things I can't do. I can't think of any program that it wouldn't hurt me if I lost it. So even though she's getting her needs met, this is... Every little piece is essential. Um, 
And even if care recipients are managing to maintain this complex and fragile network of services and supports and able to meet their needs at a given point, we found that needs change over time. And this is the benefit of doing the longitudinal data collection that we could really track respondents as things were changing for them in terms of their individual health care and needs. So care recipients have major health events or medical procedures that lead to increased need for care in their long-term services and supports. And the network's are often slow to catch up. So if they, if they ever are going to catch up without their changed needs, and this is especially true for care recipients with, um, without informal supports, such as family members that are able to just fill in the gaps between need and available care. So for example, Gladys uh, is a respondent who had a shoulder surgery after our first interview. And when I talked to her at time two, she said, before I was able to bathe without help, and she, her IHSS care, care uh, giver, is now helping me with bringing in the groceries. Every little thing I was able to do around the home, she helps me with. I need more help with everything. And even in the absence of major health events, one of the common refrains from our participants is that there's a real fluctuation in need from day to day. So there are good days and bad days, as we hear from Mitch here, who says, I'm like a lot of people, on good days I do too much, I wear myself out, on bad days I don't do anything. And so you really have to learn to pace yourself. It's really hard for me, I need a day to recover. So support networks might be adequate enough to meet needs on good days, but on bad days might not be sufficient. So now we're going to walk a little bit more in depth um, through another case of one of our participants in the home study. And for the cases I present here, we have copies of the full case studies outside that go into greater detail for you to pick up at the end of your here in person. And if you're participating virtually, uh, we'll post a link at the end that you can uh, go to for further detail on these case studies. So I'm going to talk about Fran, and we have some handouts with this graphic on it and a few more details about Fran available for you to refer to. So in contrast to Margaret, Fran is a care recipient that has really struggled to have her needs for long term and medical care met over the course of the home study. Um, so you can note that in contrast to the solid nature of the components of Margaret's care network, Fran's are represented by these dotted lines to show that they're fragmented or blank in the, in the case of services and supports that are absent for her. Um, so Fran is an 84-year-old Chinese immigrant woman with multiple and chronic health conditions, including heart disease, fibromyalgia, and arthritis, and she had a brain tumor removed a few years before we met her. Uh, she raised her son as a single working mother, was a homeowner, and was extremely engaged socially and involved in local politics for most of her life. Um, but when we started interviewing Fran in 2010, the home she'd lived in for decades was in the process of foreclosure. And um, when we was finally foreclosed on at the end of the first year of the home study, then she made three subsequent moves to different apartments after the foreclosure of her home. So three moves in a three year period, uh, hence the fragmented nature of her housing here. And she struggles to maintain an IHSS caregiver for more than a couple of months and in some cases only a couple of weeks. Um, and looks forward to having a caregiver that she's, she's able to trust to understand her health needs and really care for her when she needs someone in the future. Although she really needs help now. Um, without a caregiver, she often worried about her safety in the kitchen and limited herself to microwavable meals so that she wouldn't cut herself. Uh, she wasn't able to install grab bars in her shower uh, in one of her new apartments and preferred that a caregiver stood by while she took a shower to ensure her safety but often had to do without. She was often without an IHSS caregiver. Uh, her informal supports were really limited to a couple of friends that were available for emails and chats on the phone, but really weren't available for logistics and informational help or, or, and, um, and help with transportation and such. So Fran's case is a good example of the rationale behind the duals demonstration that's happening under the Coordinated Care Initiative. That going back to the beginning of the presentation, she would really benefit from health care overall that is better coordinated uh, for more active support and addressing the gaps in her long-term services and supports. Uh, so with this change in mind, we went back to the field a little over a year ago for year two of the home study. And this time our questions were more focused on the full network of long-term services and supports and medical care, how these networks were coordinated across one another, and the kinds of unmet needs that these respondents continued to face 
in long-term services and supports and medical care. And so these were three of our study objectives to document the complete network of long-term services and supports and medical services and identify any gaps in care, to address consumers' information needs related to benefits and services, and to explore their preferences for how care is delivered. And these are some of our findings. Uh, we're still wrapping up our data collection as we speak. And um, so for one, we identified persistent gaps in care, including access to mental health care, dental care, and reliable transportation. We also found that sources of information about changes to benefits and services are often confusing and fragmented, which invokes anxiety and concern in our respondents. So there's word of change, but it's, it, it's with little consistency and, um, and often invokes a lot of fear about what's to come. And we also learned that consumers value care, especially medical care that's provided by those who they're familiar with and by providers who are responsive to their individualized needs and preferences. And this might have some implications for how change to these familiar and responsive relationships affect our respondents. So going back to Fran, the case of Fran, to just highlight how this finding that respondents continue to experience gaps in care. This time we highlight um, the coordination of the complete medical care and long-term services and support networks. So one of Fran's primary struggles is maintaining a really complex system of transportation services. So she struggles, there are very specific rules that each with each kind of transportation service that she must follow in order to have them pick her up on time. Um, and each doctor that she has has a different source, source of transportation if they have any at all. So it's this shuttle or that, this taxi or that, or no available services. She's had multiple experiences of being left without a ride, either by formal transportation services that didn't show up or an IHSS provider that wasn't able to come to work that day. And this lack of transportation severely limited her access to medical care and social services. So she stopped going to a local senior center, reported giving up regular physical therapy appointments. Um, when she misses an appointment, she pays a high out-of-pocket fee uh, for a no-show at, at her doctor. And during her first interview in the second round of the home study, she reported that her doctor had given her an order to receive cardiac tests five months before, but due to the lack of transportation, she, had no longer, she, she hadn't been able to fill that order. So five months and ongoing, she was without taking these tests. So transportation, for one, remain, is, represents a really uh, tremendous source of opportunity for better care coordination for Fran and a source of promise under the Coordinated Care Initiative. But she's, and she's experienced gaps in other areas, including dental care, as with all of our consumers, also with finding a culturally sensitive mental health service, and has changed her primary care provider multiple times. This lack of familiarity with her primary care provider is evident in her case. So she's frustrated with her new primary care provider not listening and understanding the full extent of her medical history. For example, he attributes problems with her sinuses to allergies where she wants him to see that it actually could be related to her history of brain surgery. Um, so a lot of fragmentation and a lot of promise for better coordination. Let's see. So I'm going to move on to another couple of cases that highlight some of the other key findings from the second year of the home study. Uh, so Wilma is an 85-year-old woman who's also participated in the home study since 2010. She's a mother and grandmother and considers herself to be a lifetime learner. She went back to complete her education after her husband died and spends her time listening to books on tape about art and travel. And her primary care condition, health care conditions are heart disease, arthritis, and chronic pain. And here she articulates one of our findings, which is around the stress associated with receiving information, often in a fragmented, piecemeal way about changing changes to benefits. So when we asked all, we asked all of our respondents, have you heard anything about changes to the way you get your medical care? And she says, well, all I've heard is on TV that our Medicare is going to be cut. I heard it would be cut $400. You know, it's very stressful. So it's kind of this fragmented, informal um, set of pieces of set of uh, information that's coming and provoking anxiety in Wilma. And then she talks about how she engages with this information. So by engaging, we mean um, opening letters, understanding them, following up with those letters. 
And her ability to engage is really intersects with her own physical and mental health status. So um, she said, so Wilma actually experienced a lot of declines in her health, multiple hospitalizations and rehabilitation stays, uh, as well as the onset of diabetes and depression during our study. And so she tells us here, Medicare is always sending me paperwork on what group I want to go to and what drugstore I want to deal with. I can call HICAP, <clears throat> which is a resource for more information on the Duals Demonstration Program. So she's knowledgeable at that, about that. And talk to someone there and get some information. But I haven't been feeling good enough to do that. So she tells us that she actually uh, passes this information along to her son and grandson. So sometimes informal supports or formal supports like social workers or sometimes receptionists or exceptional primary care providers might help respondents navigate this information, but often they're left on their own to deal with news about changes. So this is uh, the depiction of Wilma's care network. Uh, she's really well connected to long-term services and supports in her county. Uh, again, through a very supportive social worker through MSSP and a consistent, non-related IHSS caregiver since we started in 2010. And she exemplifies another one of our findings that consumers value care, especially medical care, that's familiar and responsive to their needs. She expressed a great deal of satisfaction with her doctors, especially her long-term cardiologist, who she's seen for 20 years, and her rheumatologist, she's seen for 25. So she says of her cardiologist, uh, expressing kind of this sense of familiarity and responsiveness, he's been keeping me out of pain for 20 years, so I really appreciate that. He really knows my chemistry, what medicine I can take, and what I can't take. He listens to me, he's just really patient, and he can hear certain words that I say, and he knows exactly what's wrong with me by what I say, and it amazes me how he understands so much of it. So given this long-term and responsive relationship, Wilma anticipated the loss of this cardiologist under a new plan would be very difficult. And we might think about this in contrast to Fran, who, uh, if you recall, she talked about changing her primary care provider and having a very difficult time having that provider understand her medical history and listen to her in contrast to Wilma. Okay, but despite Wilma's satisfaction with her care and the feeling that she has a lot to lose if she were to have to change her medical provider, she really struggled to maintain the complex network of informal and formal transportation services it took her to get to the medical appointments. She had put together this really complex set of doctors across county, across multiple counties, and so it was a struggle to arrange formal and informal transportation to get to all of these places. Um, and she felt she no longer had the energy to maintain um, this network, and hence the fragmented depiction here of the transportation component of her network. And um, as I noted, she had significant health declines, onset of diabetes, so she, had, she no longer really had the energy to follow up um, with transportation, but also with referrals to mental health services. So doctor, she needed, uh, she had um, severe depression and her doctor provided her with a name and number, but that really wasn't enough to kind of help coordinate her care and create a continuity of care from physical to mental health uh, without some more uh, active assistance. So improved care coordination really presents promise for Wilma and assisting her to manage transportation perhaps more actively connecting her to mental health services beyond just a referral, a name and a number. And this is particularly true given her dynamic needs and um, her ability to really receive and engage with information um, over the course of the home study. Okay. So just one final case, and just to kind of drive home this idea of both uh, promise and peril, as the title of our presentation goes. Um, so this is Angie. She's a 77-year-old monolingual Spanish-speaking woman, another participant who is a working single mother and lived on her own until recently. Uh, she has Parkinson's but was diagnosed at the beginning of our study with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And she lives with her daughter, who is her IHSS caregiver but also provides many, many unpaid hours of care and works full-time herself. So Angie's socially isolated, home alone during the day, with the exception of a visiting nurse who comes once a week but doesn't speak any Spanish. Um, and so Angie might benefit from care coordination that didn't so heavily depend on her daughter. That's really her only caregiver, formal or informal. 
Um, she needs formal transportation services that help connect her to doctors during the day when her daughter's at work. And she's, has a trouble, she's having trouble connecting to mental health services that are in Spanish in her language. So there's some potential promise for improved coordination for Angie. But Angie and her daughter have reservations about some of the other changes that this entails. As a case in point, they contemplated the idea of Angie attending a community-based adult service program, uh, formerly known as Adult Day Healthcare, which would provide some relief from social isolation and some opportunities for improving her health and well-being. But they decided against it because CBAS participants have already been enrolled had, and were being enrolled at that time into a managed care program. And under such a program, Angie would lose her current doctors. And she was particularly concerned about losing her oncologist who had seen her through the treatment of her cancer. Um, so her daughter, Julia, tells us she doesn't want to change doctors, especially the oncologist and cardiologist, because they know about her cancer and they still see her and she feels comfortable. So Angie's daughter articulates some of the anxiety that consumers feel about potential changes and some of the real peril if um, there were to be a change without sufficient transfer of knowledge and understanding about respondents' medical histories, concerns, and unmet needs. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Catherine for some policy recommendations given these experiences of our home study participants. So the transition to managed care holds promise, uh, promise of care coordination. And for consumers who currently have fragmented and often inconsistent care, the promise of better coordinated care under Cal Medic Connect may mean dramatically improved continuity of care and improved health outcomes. However, given the fragile state of physical, mental, and social health and the ongoing day-to-day -day challenges experienced by these older adult consumers, the rollout of this major transition needs to be handled extremely carefully. Through the home study, we have learned that while most have in common increasing levels of disability and unpredictable changes in care needs, the individual circumstances of these dual eligible older adults are quite varied. And here in California, changes at the individual level have been happening in an uncertain fiscal policy and program environment. So what we've learned from our participants is the need to respond to them in a way that reflects their individual circumstances, needs, preferences, and priorities. And there's hope. This past January, a new rule for the use of Medicaid dollars that pays for home and community-based service waiver programs was issued by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services that requires, quote, a person-centered planning process that reflects people's preferences and goals. Um, Similar person-centered care language has also been adopted by California's Care Coordination Coordinated Initiative and the CalMedic Connect. But the next challenge will be to operationalize precisely what this means and how it will be implemented. Just this morning, I learned that CMS actually just issued yesterday new guidance for states to implement this new rule. And I haven't had a chance to really look at that yet. Um, but I would suggest that by listening to consumers and learning from them as we have in the home study, that's a very good starting point. In addition to listening to consumers, we also need to do a better uh, job of informing them, informing them of service and benefit changes, informing them of choices that they have, informing them of their rights. The realization of better care and the success of CalMedic Connect will largely depend on how well informed uh, these consumers are about their options. This will require dedicated efforts at multiple levels and using multiple pathways to conduct outreach and disseminate information at the state level and also locally in the community where individuals can, most be, can be most effectively reached um, through connections to local government agencies and community-based organizations and providers who are already serving these older adults. There are some promising efforts already un underway. For example, the Los Angeles Personal Assistance Services Council which is the public authority of IHSS in LA County, recently conducted a tele-town hall and reached more than 4,000 consumers by phone with information and the opportunity for consumers to ask questions about CalMediConnect. And the state is now considering using a similar strategy. Um, the LA Personal Assistance Service Council is also training peer mentors to further disseminate information about CalMediConnect at senior housing units and at other community-based sites other counties might consider similar strategies. 
And finally, the state's plan for CalMediConnect includes continuity of care provisions that ensure that the consumers in the period of transition can actually retain their current Medicare providers for up to six months and retain their current Medi-Cal providers for up to 12 months. But we've learned from the perspective of consumers, however, that continuity of care really means a lot more than simply retaining a single provider or doctor. Um, as we've noted throughout this presentation, dual eligible consumers rely on a full range of informal and formal supports and services. And a, a more holistic view of continuity would include providers and services and equipment of all types, all of which are critical to these individuals' health and well being. The home study has documented over the last several years um, all of these components of care that are necessary for the continued safety and independence of consumers. So I'll wrap up with that and ask uh, for comments or questions from the audience here or virtually. Jackie, you want to join me? Yeah, first a, a, a comment. It seems to me that you gave a bit of short shrift to affordable housing. Um, when it was a problem and someone was relocating, you mentioned that. But to me, I think affordable housing is fundamental. It's foundational for all of this. If you can't maintain where you live, all the rest of it falls apart. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I was wondering what, probably why that was not as clearly, and some of the diagrams of housing wasn't even listed as an issue, uh, even though that it obviously was, was there. That was sort of my first comment. And the second is I'm very concerned about continuity of care. Uh, people are going to get their managed plan uh, card. They're going to walk into their old physician's office. They're going to say, we don't take this. There's, where's the coordination going to be between the uh, Medicare people, service doctors and the new managed care plans? I'm very skeptical that that's going to work out and that six-month period will be there. Um, so I just, if you want to respond to either one of those. That would be sure. And I'll, I'll just repeat sort of the gist of what, what you commented because I, don't, I think we need to do this for the folks that aren't in the room. So your first concern was that we didn't spend a lot of time talking about the housing and that that's really foundational to to keeping individuals living at home and in the community. So I think I agree with you wholeheartedly. It is the home study. We could spend more time, and we have tomes of data, um, and that, that you know we have the, the one very um, sort of dramatic example of the person whose house was foreclosed and so forth. But I think your point is really well taken. Without a home environment that supports these individuals to continue to get the care that they need, then, then we're sort of at a loss. And it's a huge issue, especially in California, to have affordable options. So, so I appreciate that comment, and it's something that, along with all these other pieces of the network, we certainly take into consideration when we're looking at these individual cases. Um, to your second point, I think that um, your second point being that you have serious concerns about the continuity of care provisions that the state has put forth for this transition, and the concern that that the coordination between people who choose to opt out, if I'm understanding you correctly, out of their Medicare benefits and continue to get fee-for-service uh, care through their, that's not what you're saying. Um, no, what I'm okay. talking about is a six-month period when mm -hmm. you move to your management mm -hmm. Okay. and you have this continuity uh, of care during the, okay. the uh, existing position to hand it, do a warm handover right. to, right. to, the, so, to the managed plan. I'm very skeptical about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. So. You're skeptical about the transition period in which there's six months for the transition to happen under the Medicare portion of this dual eligible demonstration. Um, you're not alone. <laughs> How can I comment on that? I mean, I think that um, there's there are many concerns about continuity of care provisions, not only the length of time for the transition, but also the criteria. Um, there are there are pieces of the continuity of care provision which require that the consumer provide evidence that they've had a longer standing relationship with the provider and so forth. So I think when we get down into those details, it, it gets even more um, complicated for that transition to happen smoothly. So I think your point is well taken. Yes, sir. Uh, in this system, who's at risk financially? Uh, and who benefits from good outcomes? So the question was, who's at risk financially in the system and who benefits from good outcomes? Well, I think that the managed care entities are the ones that are uh, assuming this new population. Um, so in, on the one hand, they have an opportunity uh, by, by bringing in a new population that they haven't been serving. Uh, so they have an opportunity for some financial benefit. Um, but they have to manage a capitated payment. 
So they have to, um, they're going to have to deliver the care in an efficient way. Um, there are some questions that I think that have been raised about how, you know, what that will look like for the consumer. What are the changes that are going to be made to, to, uh, to, to achieve that efficiency? Um, is it at the health plan level or the health care provider organization level? At, at, the, the, health, sorry, at the health plan level, the managed care entity. But not the health care provider organization that's providing that medication. I'm sorry? Oh, plan. It filtered sound. It's going to vary. Only if they do that. The risk is always distributed, right? The health mm -hmm. plan assumes the risk, but it reflects the payments providers and the rate it of may or may not. in the program. It well, may or may not. It yeah. depends on. To me, the, the answer to, to solving these challenges is understanding who financially benefits from an improved outcome, mm -hmm. particularly if that outcome isn't in my shop. So if I have nothing to do with transportation <laughs> and housing, that modifies my outcome and I lose money or make money, whichever it might be. And if we don't align those, we end up not getting where we want to get to. So I'm just trying to figure out, has this really pushed more and more risk down to the healthcare provider organization, or is it no different than we've had in the past? I'm not sure I know the answer to that. I think we'll see it when it's really implemented and, and up and running. Yeah. Other comments about that or other questions? I think we're well, about that, um, I think that the you know, it's like the Costco model of, uh, you know, lots of uh, services, lots of members, they all pay a certain amount and, and ideally you can get the services for cheaper if they're the whole big group. So we'll see if it filters down. Right now there's a trigger that the Department of Finance has on the whole program. Um, the, the concern I have, though, is that if it's a pilot, why are 200,000 people in one county being shoved into mm -hmm. something with no idea what's coming? Um, especially after the expanded Medicaid, where um, I don't know how many in LA County became Medicaid under ACA, um, so but that's probably hundreds of thousands in this county alone too. So I think these HMOs are going to find themselves very hard pressed to to meet all of this coming demand. But um, my concern about who gets hurt is is on the consumer side. My name's Alan Toy, I'm the director of the Westside Center for Independent Living, and we're very immersed in these issues right now. We think that. Um, there have been no really good communications yet that we've seen any evidence of coming from the state. We've worked for years now with the HMOs to try to get them to understand and appreciate the, the levels of complexity that they're going to be facing and the need for diversity, but we're seeing nothing of that filtering up through Harbage Consulting or any of these other folks who are representing the State Department of Medical Services. And so what we have seen in the first notice that went out is there's no option at all. There's no information about it. And there's nothing that says what is your Medicare benefit versus what is your Medicare. There's nothing that says in spite of keeping out of Cal MediConnect, you still need to apply for Medi-Cal for the other services you get. There's nothing that shows you how to opt out. And I've been told they will never put that information out to the consumers. So the question is how do we get a really comprehensive education process going? And while I appreciate the past work on this and that phone call was it awesome, that's 2% of, of, of Los Angeles consumers, right. just Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And so I really think that they're rushing headlong into something that they have done absolutely nothing. And by the way, this is the senior population. These are the people who are maybe cognitively impaired or, or very infirm or don't even understand their mail, let alone read it. Mm -hmm. uh, the people who get their information from watching daytime TV or Fox News, you know. <laughs> this is the population, I'm sorry, but it is, that's the vast majority of them. And so that there really does, like the ACA spent millions of dollars rolling this out in California, here you take the most frail and impoverished section of, of people under the ACA, and you don't do diddly squat, you give less than a dollar per person for any kind of um, ombudsperson support, and you've got this whole outlier of the bell curve that would normally make an HMO be profitable. You're taking just one outlier segment of it, the poorest, the frailest, the most needy, and you're not giving them diddly. And I think this is a, a rush into disaster myself. Sorry, that's I, that was my screen. Thank you. That was Alan. That was Alan Choi. I wish I could. I wish I could repeat it, but I think uh, to sum a lot of that up, um, you have grave concerns about the communication. 
effort that that you don't see happening from the state no idea to communicate out. with this extremely vulnerable population and not a not clarity around that people have options that they can opt out what that means how they do it etc so thank you for your comments and i i don't know if the folks who are here virtually could hear all of that but hopefully we have it on record they could so and also great great so are there questions from from our virtual participants. Yes. Uh, one gentleman was wondering about uh, dental benefits for seniors. They were cut. Were they cut by Medi-Cal? Yes, these were the Dentical was cut um, in 2009. The good news is they are being reinstated May 1st, 2014. Yeah. So that's really good news. And it's also part of what's being discussed in terms of what these managed care entities will provide that's added value. They're, you know, what's being touted is that they're going to include dental and vision and transportation benefits. Um, you know, that will be guaranteed for the participants in the demonstration program. Um, and then the other piece that they are uh, sort of advancing is that initially, at least, um, there will be no cuts to in-home supportive services. If anything, the plans will need to add service, add service hours. So looking for a little promise there. <laughs> okay. Another one, a comment that Fran might be able to benefit from the PACE program. Yes, the mm -hmm. the um, the PACE program is, I think, sort of the model for coordinated care, uh, especially for dual eligibles. Um, it's the program for all inclusive care for the elderly. Uh, it goes back to Onlock in, in San Francisco a couple of decades ago, and it's been replicated across the country um, in I don't know several dozen sites. Um, and it really brings together all of the kinds of services and supports that we're talking about here. Um, PACE is an option for certain for certain dual eligibles. I'm not sure if it's an option for Fran specifically. You have to be nursing home level eligible. Uh, yeah. So Steve points out you have to be nursing home eligible, not just at risk, as IHSS participants are, but nursing home eligible in order to qualify for PACE. It's assisted living more or less. It's nursing home like. Mm -hmm. Nursing home like, but people are still in the community. Right. Yeah. More yes. Yeah. Do you feel it seems to me that the caregivers are essential to this entire system? Mm -hmm. Are there fundable approaches to supporting caregivers, whether it's peer to peer support or others? Is there a way to have viewers get that kind of support they need? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, so the question was whether there's some support for the caregivers who are so instrumental in providing care for these individuals. Um, and actually, it was an, another piece of a, a recent presentation that Jackie and I did where we talked about the caregiver needs. Um, I, on the, the list of budget cuts that, that I presented earlier, um, unfortunately, um, that wasn't up on that slide, was the Caregiver Resource Centers in California, which during that series of budget cuts of 2010, 2009, were, their, their operating budgets were slashed dramatically, like by about 75%. Um, but good news um, in this person-centered planning care process that is now being um, regulated a rule has come down from CMS about this for Medicaid waiver programs particularly specifically but hopefully we'll spread that on um, the needs of family caregivers are now going to be explicitly assessed within that person cared person-centered care planning process so that's part of the new home and community based service uh, waiver rule um, that is about to be implemented through through these programs. So I think that, that holds promise. It's recognizing the role of the family caregiver in the person-centered planning process, that in some cases they need to be more of the voice for the consumer, um, but also recognizing that they also have uh, quite a few needs of their own. So assessment is promising, but assessment without services and support I think is actually more harmful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's my anxiety, I know what I, I That's right. So is there actually a fundable element where there's a billable code or whatever way you want to think about it? I don't know if, that yeah. includes a benefit package? Yeah, I don't know if there's a billable code for that yet. I mean, this is a really, in, in a way, paradigm-wise, it's a big shift, and it's a long time coming to consider the concerns of the family caregivers and recognizing that there's such a, a critical support. Um, but I don't know if we're there yet with that. Alan, do you have some information? Yes, in response to that, in you studied the Massachusetts model, I, I take it, or maybe not, but no. in Massachusetts, the dual rollout there is um, it's younger populations. So it's not mm -hmm. seniors, but it's people who are dual eligible who are younger people with disabilities who are poor. And 
in that model, it seems like there may be R codes that allow things like independent living centers or other community-based service providers to come into the care planning team process. In California, that doesn't look like it's going to be the case so much. Um, yes, they can. a consumer can request that their caregiver or relative or another agency be a part of that team, but there's no reimbursement for that. So it doesn't really uh, encourage the participation of experts in particular issues that they may bring up as part of their care plan. Thank you for that. Yeah, um, IHSS, um, I want to make sure that everyone knows that the governor has proposed to limit credit ceiling on IHSS to 40 hours uh, a week. And he's done that because the federal government wants to pay overtime. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. He does not want yeah. to pay mm -hmm. overtime. So yeah. that means people yeah. more than 40 hours a week are going to have to coordinate and balance yeah. two IHSS workers, mm -hmm. maybe more. And I just, from the diagram you showed us, that would really be overwhelming for many people. Yeah, so the, the comment is that uh, there new, there's a new federal law which requires overtime pay. And so the, the governor of California now wants to cap the number of hours that, that consumers can get through IHSS. Um, and um, we can tell you from our interviews, I mean, this is already a huge problem for consumers uh, to, to get matched up with caregivers who also can get the, the number of hours they need to have a viable income to qualify for health insurance in some cases. And so um, to further limit that, I mean, I, the fragmentation and the, the amount of coordination, as you point out, that would have to happen would be uh, a little bit overwhelming to say, to, to understate it. I have something here. Uh, Governor Brown's proposal to use a backup system for IHSS providers flies in the face of your finding about trust and familiarity with caregivers. Can you convey your findings to legislature, legislators <laughs> and the government? Governor. Can we convey our findings? Yes, we can, and we do. Um, so we're fortunate here at the Center for Health Policy Research to have a wonderful communications team who um, helps us package our study findings into policy briefs, um, which I will um, promote in a moment. There's a, a link to our website, and uh, you can get our policy briefs, uh, which of course are that those short, concise messages that we want to pass on to legislators. We have a mailing list at the center which reaches uh, decision makers up and down the state and across the country. So yes, indeed, and we've presented uh, data from the home study in the past to committees, to the Olmstead Committee, for example, and, um, and actually some of the data from the home study has been used in certain lawsuits. Um, so, so there are ways in which what we are finding is being translated to um, hopefully um, you know, keep policymakers more informed about what's happening. That's what we're doing this for. That's really our whole premise and purpose. Are you continuing this research or is this it? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Are we continuing this research? As long as we, we can find a way to continue it, yes, we plan to continue it. Uh, as, as we noted, we're wrapping up our final round from the second wave of the home study. But we do have some ideas already about what what might happen next, and we're very excited about those ideas, and we're hoping um, and we're hoping to continue. I mean, our our goal is to kind of have you know a real like a whole decade of home study participants, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Are these individuals uh, so frail that they're not able to self manage their conditions, and they do need extra help, or are they sometimes in what you might think of as a moderate risk where they've got Diabetes not terribly out of control, mm -hmm. and hypertension, high cholesterol, uh, and they're able to manage themselves. Or is that are they really so frail that they're beyond that? It's a full range. I don't know, range. Jackie. Yeah, do you want to talk to that a little distribution, bit? Distribution. If you were to say, yeah, fifty percent of them are so frail that they can barely care for themselves. Or what, what's the distribution of trust? Uh, I would say that about uh, maybe maybe over fifty percent are managing their own conditions. Or, or, yeah. or, or over are managing their own conditions and kind yeah. of doing what they can to piece it together and then I mean we have recipients who receive the maximum number of hours who receive 24-hour care and are on ventilators. Well, um, be clear that the 24 hours is not through IHSS. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they do manage to put together 24-hour care, yes. Who need 24-hour yeah. care, yeah. should clarify. Yeah. Um, yeah, but we have a number of participants who are managing their own diabetes and uh, you know along with their primary care providers. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, that's there right. A data source that's looked at assessing the whole four hundred thousand, mm. which of them 
company, which kind of level of service ranging from uh, intensive, I can't manage my condition at all, to I just need some help around me, but I can pretty much manage my condition. Is there a data source? Is there, is there an analysis that can mm. predict amongst the 400,000, mm. which oh. ones fit these different, everybody's high risk, you know that. <laughs> them are right. lower high risk versus higher high risk. Right. So the question is whether there's some way to, to conduct an analysis of the 400,000 who will be transitioning into the dual demonstration program. Um, I don't know that we have that that data is that we have that kind of data um, available for this group. I don't know if you do or we do, but I know the people making the contracts for the level of care and what price mm -hmm. they're charging per person have had these discussions because mm -hmm. you can't do a price analysis without looking at the whole so that population. And so, you know, it's yeah. it's with the state and with the other people who are contracting the HMOs, it's got to be with that. Mm -hmm. Is that publicly available? No, of course not. They don't <laughs> give that. <laughs> it's not publicly it's, available it's public data. It's information, but it's not yeah. publicly available. Okay. Well, and I think that, I mean, that really speaks to concerns about how, you know, how, if we can't individually go and really one-on-one -on -one counsel all of the people who are eligible for this program and give them the full range, then we'd have to find a way to identify those who really are most at risk, even though, as you know, they all are. Um, but it's almost like, well, you know, let's start here and focus on, on the folks that are most likely to fall through the cracks. Um, I'd love to have those data. And is the state paying for any evaluation of this? Is there a monitoring or evaluation mechanism that this gets rolled out? <laughs> That's, that's, you know, um, one would think that this grand experiment, yes, should be some yeah, well, certainly at the CMS level, there will be evaluation, but I don't know much about the details of that, to be honest. And I know that the state's contracted with Harbage Consulting that's done evaluation previous, previous uh, transition of the seniors and persons with disabilities into Medi-Cal managed care. Um, so I don't know if they're part of uh, a plan for evaluation. I don't, I don't know the answer to what the state's doing in terms of evaluation. But it's a good question because yes, we should know whether this is working or not. Hopefully, well, sooner. Right now, is they're trying to what is it? Make a silk purse <laughs> out of a sow's mm. ear. They're marketing. They're marketing. They're marketing. Yeah. Not, not impartial surveys. Um, we're just at the top of the hour. Thank you all so much uh, for joining us. We appreciate your. Slide sharing lunch and oh and yeah I should show the last slide if I can can I get back to the for those uh, who may be interested um, who are jo who have joined us virtually or um, those in the room that don't want to take paper copies we do have a project web website um, we have policy briefs research article um, and many many case studies um, more than a dozen, I think we have about 15 individual case studies which really tell more the story of, of these consumers of care. And, and those were sort of, after we developed our first policy brief, we realized we're not able to, to do justice to all of these stories. Um, and we really do have a, a group that represents quite a range in terms of their care needs and the, the density of their network. So um, please visit our website and um, look forward to the next round of the home study. We hope. <laughs> Thank you.